Hello. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I was not expecting this many people here. Uh, I'm glad. So thank you very much for being here uh, so, so early in the morning. Um, this talk will be about tech leadership and the path uh, that I start um, carving more than one year ago uh, when I joined uh, FreeNow. First of all, I would like to, to, to thank our sponsors, uh, not only for believing in the software crafters movement, and they do uh, software craftsmanship day in, day out uh, in their organizations, but they also they put their money where their mouth is, and they sponsor these kind of events. They, they allow us to be in this magnificent venue, and, and they allow us to, to, to share knowledge together. So today is October the 6th. 15 years ago, this gentleman here, he made his debut with FC Barcelona first team. And he did it at uh, Stadio do Dragão, Porto, Portugal, my, my home country, my, my hometown. And he was 16 years old. He didn't do a great match. He didn't score any goal. And a couple of days later, he went to FC Barcelona TV studios. And he asked to, to review the match. He wanted to see where, where he could improve. And he was, he was shouting and saying, how could I miss this goal? Now, I'm, I'm not comparing to, to Messi here. So <laughs> <laughs> first things first. Um, the connection uh, is that he, he thought that there's something that was too big for him. He felt a bit lonely, although there was 50k people in the stadium. And it felt like too much for him. And this is the, where, where, where I connect uh, with this story. Because one year and a half ago, when I, when I signed up for being a tech lead at uh, FreeNow, previously known as my taxi, so I felt it was too big for me also. And that, that's why there are so many learnings uh, that I got during this year and a half. And that's why I want to, to talk to you about, about them. So a bit of context about me. I've been a software engineer for five plus years now. Uh, I'm from Portugal, as I already said. Uh, I love distributed systems. And I'm a, a tech lead at, uh, at FreeNow. And, and b before, before starting into the, into the talk itself, I would like to contextualize a bit uh, what tech lead means, because there's no common nomenclature in the industry about what tech leadership means. And in this context, uh, tech leadership means more or less a dual role. So I play a role in a more uh, project management fashion, knowing um, beforehand uh, what uh, is our roadmap for our, for our product in the next uh, six months. Uh, I talk with stakeholders. I try to align uh, all the, um, the, in this case, the backend developers in, in, in my chapter. So, so we are all on the same page. Uh, but at the same time, there's a, another part of the rule, which is um, what in some companies is called an engineering manager. manager. Uh, so I, I talk with people. Uh, I care about their, their growth and their, their, their personal development. And in this talk, I will talk um, basically about why I did uh, accept this um, tech lead role. Then a bit about uh, the, the project management uh, slash aligning part of the role. And then after, I think it's the, the thing that um, I, where I learned most uh, was about uh, treating with people and, and make, make people successful. So when, when people talk about tech leadership, um, they often think, well, great, right, promotion. <laughs> and um, it's not quite a promotion. It's a, a career change. And you, you, you stop thinking about uh, solid principles, infrastructures, code, best code ever, um, practices for, for um, building and shipping good products. And you start to think about how can I make these people work together and ship a good product together? Um, and it might think. You might think it's similar, but um, it's not quite. And when people think about the career change, 
the, the first thing that I, I started asking myself was why? Why do I want to, uh, to change something where I'm more or less good at uh, for something that I don't know if I'm even good at and I could be fired in one month? There are many reasons about why people do this change. And I group them in, in three uh, main reasons. And I will tell about what was my, my, my main driver for it. So some people, they think it's about the money, right? Who, who doesn't want to, to, to earn more money? And I will tell you that if it was just about the money, I would quit after two months. Um, actually, some companies, they want to emphasize that it's a career change and they don't even have a difference between salary bands between uh, individual contributors uh, and tech leads. And I, I think it's a, a really great thing to, to have. And then the, 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 the second uh, reason usually is, well, my manager is so busy. He's, he's in the meetings all the time. He doesn't even know what I really do. So everyone could do this job, right? I could do this job. I could do his job better than, than, than him. <laughs> So people start to think about these kind of things. And I had all kinds of, of managers, and, but I didn't actually uh, um, think in, in these kind of terms. But what kept me sometimes wake up at night was something like, if I was the CTO, what would I change tomorrow? What would I change in three months? What would I change in two years? And this kind of, uh, of question in my mind, it starts to to, to take some kind of shape. And it was one of, one of the drivers, but not the, the main one. The third, um, the third thing why sometimes people they think about uh, leadership roles or management roles is because they care about people. And I realized that I cared about people. And I realized that because in every team that I was part of in the past, I was always pushing um, to get new standards, trying new things, um, trying to help people doing pair programming, TDD, solid principles, trying to um, <coughs> build some kind of um, quality in our, in our process. So I want our team to succeed. It was not just because I liked programming. I want everyone to, to be in the same page and to succeed. <coughs> and for me, this was the, the, the main driver because the role in leadership is to make your team better, is to give them um, freedom and ownership so they can uh, succeed th themselves. And this brings me to the first of three topics that I, I picked up in the, um, in the more the project management part of the role, which are for me balance, vision, and learning from failure. And the context for this is that we, I was in an organization, Free Now, that um, hired lots of people in a short amount of time. So in, in two years, uh, the team was from 100 to 300 people. Uh, lots of new um, people in house. We, are, we have every competitors, as you know, very qualified, borrowing millions of euros, trying to, to get market share. Um, so these three things allowed us to, to align ourselves in the company uh, and, and, and to make uh, our product better. So first, balance. Product, tech, and people. You know that your product guys, they, wa they want to, to ship the um, a new feature as fast as possible. They want to get to market. Oh, let's go, let's get to market, guys. It is really important. And then on the other side, you see that the amount of users that you have in your system, it's growing and growing day in, day out, and that you need to, to make it with scalable technology because if you ship a product on day one and on day three you need to rebuild it, uh, it's not worth it. There are some market, marketing campaigns that are going, going on. And the, if, you do indeed, if you don't do it right, uh, it might have a bad impact in your, in your image. And on the other hand, there's the people. People, they, they are eager to, to try new technologies. They want to, to write the best code. And the, the question that arises is like, how do I deliver a good product on time 
with quality while keeping the, 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 the team engaged in, in, in all of this. So this, for me, was a, a, a major challenge. And for me, the, the, um, the answer for this is to give context. Context to your product people. So wh when they say, yeah, we want to ship this feature tomorrow morning because it will have a massive impact in, in, in the market, you can say to them, OK, I understand why you want it. I want it to ship it too. But we have this and this constraint in our current system. And it's about to break. So if we, if we, we can ship it tomorrow, and we'll be happy about shipping it tomorrow. But then on, on, on Saturday or on Sunday, perhaps the, the system won't, um, won't work anymore. And the same is true for in the engineering team, right? Uh, yesterday, Javi and, and Rafa, and they, were, they were talking about the, the purism that sometimes software engineers they have about their code, right? They, they, they like to write beautiful pieces of code. And this is true in every organization, and free now is no exception. But also, it's important to give them the context so, so they can do some trade-offs, right? If, if you say to people, OK, I know that this is not an ideal situation. I understand you. But our, our product, if we don't ship this, will have an impact of not making 2 million euros in revenue. And to, this 2 million euros in revenue is what is paying your salary at, at, at the end of the month. So uh, it's not to, to, to scare anyone. It's just to, to give them the context so people know about what they are deciding. Because sometimes they, they think that people are just pushy about product or, or new features because the, they want it fast and they don't care about quality. They do. But if you don't frame it correctly, you'll be uh, in trouble. Another thing that I learned it's really important, vision. Every company has a vision and, and values and these kind of things. Again, we are no exception. But the, the, the question is, how do we translate this vision, the, the company vision, to something that our engineering team um, feels, feels their own? So it's not. Not something, not something like a vision of someone in the mountain. It's something that um, affects them day in and day out. Unfortunately, our, our, our CEO, Eki, he does a really great job explaining the company vision. So we want to make mobility available for everyone, independent of age, income, or heritage. So it's quite, it's quite easy to, to explain. And he goes one step further. He says that if we want to do it, we need to be one of the three players, one of the top three players in Europe, together with Uber or uh, whatever. If we don't have the scale to, uh, to achieve it, we, we, we can't achieve this vision. And how do we translate this to, to, to a tech vision? We, we start to think between uh, our engineering leadership um, people. Uh, we start to, to talking with our developers about what, what, what does it mean for our, for our uh, daily lives. And we got to the conclusion that if we want to be competitive, if we want to compete with these big companies, we need to be able to ship things as soon as possible with as much confidence as possible. We need to be able to deploy 10 times a day if needed. We need to deploy on Fridays. We must not be afraid to deploy on Fridays. And that's why, <laughs> and that's why we achieved the vision of, we, we, we started with the vision of having continuous deployment. Having continuous deployment is what will enable our business to go faster. And this is how the thi so the vision is good is good okay you set the vision no problem but how do you do how do you go from the vision to, to production how, how do, what does that mean and in my case what what what, uh, what I proposed based on on, on what, uh, what other companies and what other tech organizations were doing was to start writing RFCs uh, how many people write RFCs usually in their companies? OK, a couple of you. Um, uh, and the RFC is something st more or less standard in the open source um, community, and it stands for Request for Comments. It's a document where you, stand, where you will put the, the background ab about something. It could be like designing a new system, or it could be an improvement in your product. You state uh, what's the problem that you want to solve, what are the alternatives, and then you, you, you evaluate them based on some criteria. And then people vote and comment, 
and, and uh, you can start uh, building it. And why RFCs and why RFPs are important? For me, they're important because they democratize the access to uh, take part in the, in, the, in, the, in the building process. If some, if some team is building a new service from scratch and you are not aware of what are the trade-offs that they are doing, perhaps when you need to maintain that thing, you'll, you'll be thinking, why? Why they did this? I, I don't understand it. Second of all, it makes decisions transparent. It's not like we have a couple of architects in the mountain saying, yeah, we need to do this and this with diagrams, but then they don't code. We don't have this in, in our organization. And making decisions transparent is also about making people be conscient um, about the, the trade-offs that, that they are making. So if someone says, yeah, we, we know that this is not perfect, but this will allow us to go into production instead of three weeks in one week, maybe uh, then someone can, can, can see why the, this decision was, was made. It gives also, again, context. It's, it gives the, the problem that we are trying to solve. And somehow, people sometimes they, they, they think that, OK, you are trying to solve this problem, but I, I found this workaround that could, uh, that could uh, buy us like two months more. So we, we don't need, to, we don't need to, 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 to do it now. So we can defer commitment. And um, we, we, can make, uh, we can postpone decisions that might affect our, our organization. RFCs are nice, but the, the other part that makes our vision reality is giving freedom to people. So we set our vision, we set our goal, but we don't define how we want to achieve it. This is up to our engineers because we hire them because they are skilled to take these decisions. If we hire them and we are taking decisions uh, for them, why did we hire them in the first place? And it's, it's quite nice because since we defined this vision, in, in the last hackathon that we had in the, in the company, we had two people out of their own initiative that um, they build a system to, to achieve continuous deployment in a much more safer uh, way. And no one asked for it. There was no proposal from, from uh, any tech lead or any, any manager about building it. But they wanted to, to achieve it, and they, they, find, they found a way to, to do it themselves. OK, NFTs are nice, a vision is nice, everything is going well, we are hiring like hell, no problem. But then things happen, right? The system in production is on fire, Friday 7 in the evening, everyone wants to, everyone wants to go home, what's happening? Customers are uh, calling our customer care and say, hey, I, I trust in your application to make money to, to earn a living, and you are failing to me. Um, and the important part of this, of, of having these fires, especially in a hyper-growth context, is that you assume things can go wrong. But what's also valuable is to learn from it. Because if in one month you are 10 developers, the next month you are 40, the next month you are 70, not everyone is familiarized with, you, with your best practices. Perhaps some pull request was approved, but no one really uh, understood the system uh, like people that were in the company five years ago. So these things happen. And here, the, the, the key point of, of failure is to learn from it. And this is why we have company-wide public post-mortems. After an incident, it's required that people that were in the incident and product teams get together, put up a timeline, what went wrong, what went well, what are the actions that we will take to make these not happen in the future. And this also gives transparency to management, right? When, when they see that we are losing 200K in one day, they, they don't start running in circles asking why, what happened, didn't the marketing campaign work or something? No, you, you send an email to the whole company and say, hey, there was an incident, this is the post-mortem, this is the actions that we will take. Everyone, of course, people are not happy about these kind of things, but they, they, they feel that they can trust you and they can trust your engineering team because you are being professional enough to recognize a mistake and to take actions upon it. 
an important part of postmortems is that I've seen that in some companies, postmortems are only run by the uh, people that are on call or, or something like that. Please involve your product teams. If your product teams are not involved, if your product teams are not um, taking the actions to improve the system, they will make this mistake again and again and again. And uh, the, the knowledge about what, what happened and why it happened won't be spread um, in, in the company. And when, you and when you hire 20, 30 people month after month, this is, this is quite important that everyone is aware of um, what, make, what, may things, uh, what may make things break or not, uh, especially in a high, highly, highly scalable environment. OK, vision, uh, balance, vision, and learning for framework. The, the three things that in the, in the project management part of the role, uh, I think it, they were most valuable for, for me and for my team. What about management? What about people? This is one of the key parts of being a manager. Feedback. Everyone says that, right? When, whenever you are going to, to, to be a manager, people, you need to be good at feedback. OK. <laughs> what, what does that mean? What does it mean? What, what does good mean? And for me, there are two different kinds uh, of feedback. If you want, so first of all, people sometimes they think that feedback is only when people did bad things. But feedback is also when people did good things, right? If people are improving uh, a system for the for the whole company, give them feedback. Hey, I I saw that yesterday you you went to production with this change, and it has a massive impact. We are well, we are making much more money about it. The systems are much faster about it. So give praise to these people. And sometimes people, they don't want even public recognition. Because it's also another thing that people say about feedback, right? Uh, praise in public, criticize in private. But some people, they prefer to be praised in private. The other day, I was talking with someone in my team. Uh, and I asked to him, how, how do you like to? To, to be recognized. And he said, ah, I, I prefer that I, I, I'm recognized in these one-on-one -on -one meetings uh, because I can, I can look into your face and uh, it's much more personal for me. It has, it's much more meaningful for me. Uh, and that's something that um, some people, they, they, they don't understand up until we talk with people because um, the, the usual thing to do, the thing that's in the book, is like praising public. <coughs> they, they don't even challenge their, 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 this assumption. Now, feedback whenever you want some, someone to improve where, or when someone did something uh, or some attitude that was not correct. First, it should be constructive. It shouldn't be like, your Kotlin code is garbage. This doesn't help anyone, right? It should be also specific. If, if, you, do, if you say to someone, you are not good at communication, what does that mean? Is that I'm not communicating well with my peers? Is that I'm not communicating well with my product owner? What, 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 so be specific. It's like, I noticed that in your RFCs, uh, people comment a lot and ask a lot for clarifications. What, what, uh, what do you see that we could improve on that? So make sure that first you state facts. And you, you, don't, you don't judge, so don't say this is good, this is bad. Observations and facts. Then be kind and be empathetic. Because imagine that uh, someone did a deployment, it went to production, and then he, everything exploded. Well, don't fall into the trap of thinking, about, yeah, he didn't test the code. That's why, right? That's why something uh, went wrong. <coughs> Talk to people. Search for the root cause. Search for why. Why, why, why did it happen? Why did you think it happened? And sometimes people will say, yeah, it happened because my product owner was pressuring me so that I skipped the tests. I wanted to be in production. So then we can fix the, the root cause. Or it could be something more personal. Yeah, I, was, I, was, uh, I wasn't feeling well that day. My girlfriend was in the, in the hospital. And I couldn't think straightforward. So 
if you know the root cause, you can then understand better your people and you can give more meaningful feedback. Another thing about feedback is that sometimes people, they, 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 it passes like one week between something that uh, happened, good or bad, and uh, the feedback. And this is not good because if you, if you give immediateness to the, to the feedback, if, if someone did some inappropriate uh, thing in your team, you can say to him, hey, let's talk five minutes. And you can say to him, hey, this, uh, I observed this behavior of you. Uh, what do you think about it? Uh, what, what do you think the other, the other people felt about it? These kind of things. And to be immediate means that these people, they, they think more straightforward and they, 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 they remember much more these moments so they don't do it again. If you do it one week later, you are sending a message that eh, it was not so important, right? Because, yeah, one week later he said something to me. As a manager, we talk about feedback. And one of the most important parts of the feedback for me, was the one-on-ones, something that ch changed my mind. One-on-ones are uh, somewhat formal meetings between a manager and, and, and uh, the employee, usually the, every two weeks, every week, every three weeks, uh, not more than that, and usually between 30 minutes and one hour. And by the way, in the, in the last two weeks, who spent one hour talking with their manager? OK, not bad, not bad. <laughs> for, for those that didn't, please send me your CV. <laughs> <laughs> for me, one-on-ones are important. And some people, they say, yeah, in an, in an ideal world, one-on-ones shouldn't exist because uh, managers and, and employees should talk every, t uh, every now and then. And it's an unnecessary bureaucracy, these kind of things. But then you see your manager. Some managers even they, they have this policy of open door policy. Okay, they 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 say yeah whenever you want to talk with me just talk with me. But then people want to talk with their manager and they see their calendars and it's full busy. You can't talk with him. You see him in the in the hall and he looks busy. So people they they start to think okay so perhaps my problem is not that important so it doesn't require his or her attention. So. Yeah, I just skip to, to talk with my manager. So the message that, that um, we do and that we send, creating these one-on-one -on -one meetings every two weeks or something like that, is that you care about people. You block time to listen to people. And this is quite a strong message because they, they know that no matter what, every, every two weeks they will have one hour to talk with you. And I said they're going on once. They are important for me also. They are important for, for the manager. Why? I think they help us to create relationships. I'm, I'm not going to be cynical here. I'm not um, going to the cheap psychology part of the things. I'm not trying to be the best buddy of people in, in the, in the one-on-ones. But creating relationships allow me to understand much better this person. So. They are, they are not a status meeting. When people, when people come to one-on-one -on -one and say, yeah, this week I was doing this thing in this service, I say, okay, okay, I know. Because if you are a good manager, you, you, also, you also know the status a priori. You don't wait for the one-on-one -on -one to get the status for your, your, your team members. I prefer to talk about things like, how was your weekend? Last week you went to Belgium with your wife in a road trip. How was it? Last week, I, I saw that you sent a message in Slack about going to, to the hospital. Is everything OK with you? And this kind of, of relationships that you create with, with, with people allow you then to, to, to shift and, and, to, and, and to understand them better and to understand what, what are their kin, what, what, is the projects, what are the projects that mo motivate them more or less, what are the things that they would like to, to be doing and they are not. What are the things that the company should improve in order to, to make people happier? And this is important, connecting again with the balance in the project, uh, project management side. Because if you know the roadmap in six months, and if you know what your people are interested in, you can start 
thinking about when are, there are new projects upcoming, you can start thinking, okay, I think this, this person will be interested in this project. Uh, so it makes your life also easier when you need to, to sell these kind of new projects to, to the team and, and, and makes also the, this team member happy because they, 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 they feel that you are listening into, into, their, into, into their goals and objectives so they, they, can, they can be um, more productive and they can <coughs> develop themselves. It's also a great moment to clarify uh, anything doubt that your employee has. I know that most companies, they do all hands every month. It's one hour, and there are some people that are not, they are not really interested in these kind of things. They want to, um, to build a great product, but they don't want to spend one hour of their time looking into the big figures and these kind of things. And this is why in, in, this, in this meeting you can clarify some doubts about what do you think about the new strategy of the company? And some people, they say, I didn't think about it. Do you know what are the implications on your team? Do you know what are the implications on your roadmap? So you can start to set expectations and, and contextualize uh, some future work that, that may happen. So the next, the next step, so feedback, one-on-ones, and the next step, performance reviews. Who does performance reviews in their company? OK, quite a lot. In our case, performance reviews are blind. So I evaluate uh, what I think uh, the employee did well the last three months, what I think it could improve, the sa uh, and same for me. And he does the same for him and, and, and for me. So he evaluates me also, So just not a uh, one-way street. And here is the thing. If you did your job well in the one-on-ones, here you won't be surprised. It will be like, in an ideal situation, the things that you write in, in your blind review and the things that your employee write should match 90, 95% of the time. If not, it's that you did something right. You were um, busy with other things and perhaps you were not um, taking um, time to listen to your, to your people. And this happened to me. I had one, 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 uh, one guy that I, I, was, I was seeing that he was a bit strange. He was like, what happens to you? Yeah, I think I'm not productive enough. I've been in the company three months now, and I think I'm, I'm, not, I'm not up to speed with the technology. I think people are talking about everything, commenting LFCs, and I'm overwhelmed. And the funny part is that 10 minutes before, I was talking with some of my engineering peers or, uh, and my manager, and I was saying, you know, this guy, this guy is amazing. He's been doing an amazing job. <laughs> I'm really happy about it. And when he it, when it told me this, I was like, oh, I, I'm not doing my job properly. So I, I, I failed at you to provide you the, the context and to, and, and to say to you that you were doing a good job despite this massive thing that is happening in, in the company, hiring 30 people a month. Performance reviews are also a good time to connect um, to your career ladder. So if you have something like junior engineer, intermediate engineer, senior engineer, principal, and you, have, you, you have like a framework of evaluation in different, uh, different dim dimensions. So communication, um, code, software architecture, these kind of things. It also gives you the, the opportunity to connect the, um, the performance of your employee with it and you can say, I, I noticed that you, you are now mastering communication between you and your peers. And then you can take the, the one step more and say, so what, what is the challenge now? How could you improve further in, in, in these kind of things? Also, performance, re oh, performance reviews again. If you were giving context to product and talking to product day in, day out, you also know the challenges that are ahead. So in this, mo in, this, in this performance review, you can present and say, hey, I have these two challenges in the next six months. One is about security. Uh, the other one is about uh, slicing this part of the monolith 
and it will be quite complex. Uh, these two projects, they have high impact, and I, want, I, and I know that you want to have high impact. Do you want to take one of these? Do you want to take the lead in, in one of these? <coughs> but I don't expect an answer of yes or no um, in, in that moment. I ask, I, I, what I say to them is don't worry about the yes or no answer. Don't, don't feel pressured. Let's talk next week. Come up uh, with your own goals. You know the, 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 comp the company strategy. You know the projects that are, are ahead of us. But perhaps you know other things that could improve even more than our product. So take your time, uh, create the goals, and then let's, let's talk about it. And then some, some really good conversations happen. Because people, they, they present you the, the goals, and, and you can start challenging them. Not just for the sake of challenging, not, not just um, to, to make people feel bad, but to, to, to ask them, OK, you, you want to improve this service? How will you measure that you improved it? Did you think about it? Because if, if you didn't think about how to measure uh, this goal, how will we in three months assess if the goal is done or not? You, you, will put us, you will put us in a difficult situation, and it will not be good for, for, for any of us. Also, some people, uh, they, they put some goals like uh, reading a book. Uh, and you can say, OK, I like that you read books. I understand why you read books. But reading a book is not um, a goal in itself. What do you want to achieve when, when, when reading this book? What, what's the the thing that you are looking for to, and when, when you finish reading the book, that you can bring to, to our organization. OK, you didn't read the book. You don't know a priori what, what it can bring to you. But uh, what, what is the, the thing that you are looking for? Push the limits. Challenge people. Because when you do this, so when you set these goals with people and you, you, you make them free to come up with the, the, the goals themselves, you are giving them the ownership of their own destiny. So instead of telling them what to do, they, they tell you, I would like to do this. And then you, are, you, you set expectations and you, you say, OK, I like that you want to do this. We are, well, I understand how we will measure it. Now, my expectation is that this happens, or to have um, this impact. Setting expectations will also improve the, the ownership of people, because they know that you expect something from it. Perhaps you don't expect the goal to be achieved, but you expect that if something is not going well in the first month, in the first two weeks of the, of the project, that these people come back to you and say, hey, I know that I had this really ambitious goal. Um, but things are not working quite well. The IT department doesn't let me install whatever software that I need. So uh, perhaps we need to, to think about it, or you need, you need to, to help me uh, circumvent the problem, or something like that. So people, they care much more about these things if they are free to, to choose them, and if they are empowered to, to, to achieve them. This is one of my favorites. Transparency. Transparency to whom and why? Transparency to your stakeholders. Make them aware of the problems that you are facing in your daily life. Make them aware of the problems that you are facing while, while hiring new software engineers. So they, can, they can see that you are doing something for um, with a purpose, and you are not just procrastinating somewhere. So they can say, eh, why didn't you hire the 10 engineers that you said you would hire this quarter? Well, if you are transparent about all these things, people will also show empathy towards you. And they will say, OK, I know that you tried 20 different people. We are not paying salary markets. That's why we are not getting um, these people into the funnel. So let's, let's fix the situation. Also, transparency towards 
the team. Many times in companies, you see that people, they, they don't trust their managers because they think that some, there are some obscure hand-picked people that they get the best projects ever and other people that they never get uh, a great project with, with mass impact. And eight months ago, we had this uh, task force in order to solve a, a concrete problem in our organization. And I was, I was thinking about being as transparent as possible. And I, I, I said to my manager, Nico, we need to be transparent with people. We need, if, if we need two people in this task force, let's make uh, a formal application process. Let's state what are the goals. Let's state what we expect. Let's state what are the skills, not that people must have, but the people uh, would need to, to, to complete the job. Let's make the, the evaluation framework public. So whenever we need to select two out of four or five people that present themselves into the positions, we can say, yes, you are being picked because of this, this, and that. And no, you are not being picked at this time because this, this, and that. And this creates a lot of trust in your organization because people, they don't think anymore that you have your preferity, um, that, that you handpick, and uh, all your friends always get the, the, the best projects. And also, there's an important part of, of the thing is that you get the opportunity to say no to people. And I know that this is a, a hot topic in management. Some people, they, they don't like to say no because, it, yeah, it's bad. People won't like me. Um, people will be frustrated. But saying no to people doesn't mean no forever. It's right now, for this thing, no. But it can be in the future. You will need to work on uh, this thing and this thing, and you'll be considered for uh, the next, the next, ta ne next tax for, for instance. Make this decision, making this decision process transparent allows you to have this, this trust in, in your team that otherwise it will be really difficult to, to have. Another hot topic, conflicts. <coughs> conflicts are also together with feedback, one of the hot topics for, for, for management. How do we handle conflict? Um, and there's different levels of conflict uh, across organizations. Uh, just to give you an example of mine, uh, Freenow started in Germany. It was the first tech hub in Hamburg. And then uh, they, they opened here in Barcelona and then in, in, in Berlin, also in Germany. And we got a product, in this case, the driver application um, product where they, they received the tools from the passengers that was created in Hamburg. So th there was this um, feeling of uh, it's my baby, right? So uh, whenever people started to be hired in Barcelona, started to creating pull requests, start to making modifications to code, there was this friction um, because people would say, yeah, your guys, they don't know what they are doing. They are changing things. Uh, and they, don't, they are not doing it in, a, in the proper way, these kind of things. And what I learned here is that playing the, the, the telephone game is really bad. So if someone says to you, yeah, your employee did, 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 did something, I didn't like it because of X, can you take care of it? I always say no. <laughs> did, you, did you tell this to him? Did you tell this to him in an empathetic and kind way? Did he understand the, the, what was the, the, the problem that, uh, and what were your feelings? Because if people don't try to talk with each other, it, uh, it starts to create like a snowball where, where people start to say, hey, I hate this guy. He never says what I, what I want in the, uh, in the pull request. Uh, his code is garbage. I don't want to talk with him. And if you make people talk, then they, they understand each other. Then they start, OK, I understand your point. I will try to change next time. And it will uh, smooth the, the, the review process. Sometimes it is not enough. And I, I make explicit that you talk to these people. If there's no agreement between you, I will take this problem as mine. And I will try to mediate the, the, the problem. But first, please, try to, try to talk with him. 
I fell into this trap of playing the, the, the telephone game once or twice, and then I said, okay, I, I won't do it anymore because uh, I'm creating a, a problem here where people are starting to, to hate each other, or I didn't understand exactly what um, the, the, the problem was, so I, I was misinterpreting the, the, the problem, so I was creating an even bigger problem between these two people. And I think this is really, really bad, and especially really bad if you have remote teams or teams that don't work in the same office, so they don't see themselves uh, day in and day out. There are also some, some conflicts that um, arise when you need to throw away ideas, throw away um, code, or even rewrite some kind of the documentation because it's outdated and it's not serving our business purposes anymore. Again, give context to people. Try to detach the individual from the, the solution and from the code. Don't, don't fall into the trap of um, your team members treating their code or their documentation as their baby and say, okay, I understand that you are proud of your work. I also am I'm, I'm proud of your work. But not the company, it's another different thing. So it's not, it's not you or I that should be, um, so we, we are both aligned on that. But now the company needs another thing. So it's time to let it go. And it's time to, to look for new challenges where you can have uh, impact again. And then again, let, let people talk because 99% of the, the conflicts arise from, from miscommunication, from, from people uh, not communicating well uh, with, with their peers and um, simplifying the problem like this is garbage or this is great instead of uh, thinking twice or thrice uh, and think about um, what really uh, what really is uh, the problem at hand. And for miscommunication, the, um, the best way to tackle it is to, to communicate better. And uh, what I learned in this year and something is that written skills are really important for software engineers. So it's not just write code, it's not just write documentation, is to write well when you, uh, when you are addressing your product owners or your peers in order to explain a concrete problem or a concrete solution. Because if you don't do this, you are opening your, yourself into misinterpretation, miscommunication, and sources of conflict. It's also important, again, to communicate in every direction, not only with, with uh, upper management, with your employees, with different teams that might touch your service, with Scrum Masters, with Agile, with everyone in the company. Depending on the context, the amount of information that you need to, to send is one or the other. But please communicate up front, be proactive about it. And then, again, getting into the, into the hyper growth um, problem again, communication is hard in a hyper growth environment because there's so much, so much information flowing. So much, so. When I, when I started in the company, there was more or less 150 microservices. And the other day, I run the same query, and there are 300 and something. So the, the, the velocity that we ship new features and we create new things is stunning. So then we need to think about what's the right amount of information that I should pass to my people. Do they care about everything? And then balance that with, with the other value that I, that I think it's uh, important, with transparency. So if I'm not passing this into my team, am, am I hiding the thing? Or uh, am I giving them more uh, room in order to, to do their job more focused? So you need to balance these trade-offs. And the, the way I, I, I try to, to improve it is in, in every communication that, that I sent, uh, I put a header which is action required or not, if an action is required from the team, trying to put some uh, too long, didn't, don't, don't need to read um, for, uh, for some messages. So, so people, they need a summary of it. And if they are interested, they can jump into the full thing. If they are not interested, they can say, OK, this is not for me, or currently I'm not interested in this thing. And this improves massively um, the, the, the communication. And the two things that I introduced in the organization and that I got good feedback about uh, being good uh, for our communication were the following. First, um, a template for, for pull requests. <coughs> we realized that sometimes people didn't understand the context of, of, of the code. So 
yes, you had a user story to do, yes, you had a Jira ticket, but they didn't understand what, why we were touching this code and not the other. So uh, we start um, experimenting with this um, pull request template. We give the, the background, we give the, the problem that we're trying to solve, we give, we give the goal, and we give some uh, implementation details or caveats if it's the case. And the thing here, and what, what surprises me most, is that sometimes what people code doesn't address the problem. And this is really cool because then you see people that jump into the pull request and they don't start discussing um, things like, yeah, you, you are missing a semicolon here, but they start thinking, okay, I, I see that you are trying to solve this problem, but touching this code doesn't solve it entirely because you are missing these and these use cases. So it gives us um, a sense also of the, of the trade-offs that are made. Perhaps people would, would, would comment in the, pro yeah, this doesn't follow GDD principles, but if you put it here in the, in the considerations part, I'm not following the principles because of X, Y, and Z, then people, they don't comment on it and the, it also makes the, the pull request really much more smooth. Another step further on this uh, is that if you do this, do this as the commit message and that GitHub or uh, any GitLab or Atlassian stash, they pick this as the pull request description, you give also uh, a documentation and you give also context when doing git blame. So when you are looking to the code and seeing who the hell is this and why is this here, you can do git blame and see, oh, 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 this was the, the, the background, I understand it now, I understand what was the trade-off and then I can, I can think better about uh, the solution that I'm about to, to implement. <laughs> the other thing um, that I, I learned, and actually I copied this from, from other companies, was to create a readme about me. It basically states uh, what, are, what are my values, where people uh, and when people can, can find me, uh, what are the time that I'm available through Slack, uh, through email, um, what do I expect from people and what people can expect from me. Uh, so I, for instance here I say that people can count on me to write some code, but I won't, writing, I won't be writing code 100% uh, of my time. And this is quite important to set expectations between us. Um, this does not substitute the one-on-ones, does not substitute any uh, personal feedback, but it's like a documentation that people can use and they can also challenge me. Because if I say that, that we hire people because of their skills and then I'm being a micromanager, they can say to me, hey, I, in your readme, <laughs> you say that you trust people, why are not you trusting me? So, it's really powerful for, for people as well. <coughs> so, we talked about many things today. Transparency, communication, ownership, feedback, uh, empowerment. Many, many things that I talked uh, here and that I learned here. I, did, I didn't invent anything. I'm, I read a lot about what other companies were doing. And these four books were really, really, really important for me. Out of them, only one is about engineering management itself, which is the elegant puzzle from Will Larson. He was an um, engineering manager at Stripe and Uber, uh, so he knows well what are the problems with hypergrowth. All, all of the others, they are um, really good about how to, how to let things go, how to give freedom to people and not be afraid of it, uh, and I, I can only uh, recommend them. So, if you want to be a tech lead or engineering manager at Freenow, we are hiring. This is it for today. Thank you very much. I'm open to any questions. <laughs> questions? Oui. Sorry. <laughs> Hi, Mar. Um, well, first of all, I would like to thank you for the talk. I think it was very inspiring. Um, so I would have some questions. Of first, well, I suppose you are happy about the change because you are, and I would uh, like to ask you what is the thing that you like more on your current role, or and what you are missing, 
And then uh, just, just if you fear, because for instance, sometimes for, for instance, for me, I'm looking maybe of making this change, but I'm, because I think, for instance, I do care about people. I think I'm good like having big picture, but sometime I, I fear that maybe I'm not the best or more senior software engineer, like maybe the, like the faster, though I'm better maybe at, at this higher level. And yeah, if you had some of these fears when, or some other when you change the role. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so answering your, your first question about what do I like m m most or, or, or less. What do I like less is I'm a, I'm a really techie guy, so I don't code as much as I would like to. What I like most is the impact that I have in the team. <coughs> and seeing the, this progress in this, this last year makes me really feel, feel proud of uh, what, what uh, we achieved together. Regarding your question about thinking about being a tech leader, not being the right person for, for the role, um, some people, they think that being a tech leader is about being the best software engineer in the room. Um, I don't think that. I think that if you have the, these skills that you were mentioning, more, most of uh, seeing the big picture, uh, communicating, talking with people, I think these are better qualities than to be the best coder in, in, the, in the room. Because if, if your job is 30% or 20% coding and 70% the other thing, uh, I think this gives you already a sense of what are the, the, the skills that, the, that are important. And um, I know that some people, they, they are afraid of this, this job. Um, make, your, make your call, jump into it. Uh, some companies, they are more supportive than others. For instance, we, we offer people a leadership course where they can learn about uh, techniques and what are the things that are expected from them um, before they, they go into the, into the role so they can start um, applying some of these things and seeing if they, they w would be a good fit or not. Um, but yeah, that is my, my piece of advice, is, uh, if I can give one. <laughs> Anything else? Uh, you, you said you're a techie guy. How do you do make the balance? I find that's the hardest thing is you want to do one, you know you need to do the other. How do you, on a daily basis, how do you do that? Uh, the reality is that fortunately, I don't need to work much on that because I have really great product and business people are really great engineering guys that we understand and we empathize with each other really well. Uh, so everyone is aware of the trade-offs. We give context to each other. We say, OK, I know that we, you want to go to production tomorrow. We can't. And people understand. And on the, on, the other, on the other hand, people also understand when the business has some critical thing that they, they want in production. Now, these, uh, there are some organizations where this doesn't, doesn't happen. and. I think it takes, it takes effort. It, um, you need to talk with people, uh, especially product people. My recommendation would be to try to understand why they are being so pushy about something. Because perhaps they, they tell you one thing, but they are really being pushy because of other totally unrelated things. So you could fix this root cause instead of um, trying to discuss about if this should be tomorrow in production or not. Okay, no more questions? Okay, thank you very much. I will be around in the conference, so if you want to talk. <laughs> <laughs>